This is an interview with Sarah Emerson Farwell. It's June 14th, 2007. I'm Forrest Larson in the Lewis Music Library. It's my distinct pleasure to um, interview Sarah Emerson Farwell. It's June 14th, 2007. I'm Forrest Larson, we're in the MIT Lewis Music Library. Sarah is a retired actress and acting teacher and daughter of the distinguished composer Arthur Farwell, who was MIT class of 1893. The purpose of this interview is for you to talk about your father, but I wanted to briefly go over your professional background so that there is a context for what you have to say. Um, so um, you studied with Kirsten Linklater, a prominent vocal coach. Um, That's Kristen Linklater. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, and you acted in some, some Broadway productions? Oh, only once. That was just an understudy, and I went on one night on Broadway. <laughs> which, 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 uh, what show was that? That was Tea and Sympathy. Uh-huh. And, and uh, I was understudying a, a secondary, not the lead. I also understudied the lead, but she never got sick. Uh -huh. But the other la lady did, so I went on. Okay, and then there were some other places that you acted and directed, like the Tyrone Theater in Minneapolis? Oh, there I was uh, finishing my study to become a teacher of voice to actors. Okay. And uh, that was a very interesting year. We met Tyrone Guthrie, of course, and uh, Kristen was there teaching us, and it, it was a wonderful year, part of this grant that was a Rockefeller grant I was on. Fantastic. And then at the Cleveland Playhouse, you did some work there. Oh, for a little while. I took one semester away from my teaching at uh, the UW in Seattle uh -huh. and uh, went over to Cleveland and uh, did some work with the actors of the company. Yeah. Fantastic. And then um, you were assistant professor at the Yale School of Drama. What years were, th were, th were those? 1970 to 1972. I was at Yale as an assistant professor, and it was um, the boss, the dean, who made me an assistant professor. And I got a, began to get a little more decent salary, which was a great <laughs> help, because I was taking care of my children. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, and one last thing, um, you acted in a one-woman show by William Luce. Is that how you pronounce it? L-U-C-E? Oh, that's the, the Bell of, Am of Amherst. Right. Is that pronounced Luce? Luce. Okay. Bell of Amherst. That right. was a great privilege. That When I had a group of friends living in Westchester, we did it at the Scarborough School in uh, Scarborough, New York. And... Uh, it was a great privilege to be able to do this wonderful work that Luce wrote and and share it. Right. I also did it in Arizona 10 years later when I was 70. My, where in Arizona? <laughs> Tucson. Uh-huh. And this is... I a, had retired there. Wow. So this is a play based on the life of Emily Dickinson. Oh, um, yes. Indeed it is. And uh, according to my records, it opened in 1984. It opened in 1984, is that correct? Yes, that was yeah. right. I okay. did it in uh, Scarborough School. Right. Okay. Tell me about your childhood piano lessons. Oh, well, we were all offered piano lessons on Dad's Mason and Hamlin, which was a wedding gift to my father and mother as children. And... Uh, some of the others did it, like my sister did very well with her piano. Was that Beatrice? Beatrice. Yes. And uh, I did not. I hated it. I wanted to be out climbing trees, riding my bicycle. I was a tomboy. And uh, the campus was a great place to run around and roller skate on, and, and that was, for me, uh, much more important than learning to play the piano. So I didn't do it until yeah. I went to boarding school. Uh -huh. Later, I did study some, a little. I had a good year. I got as far as Fur Elise. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> right. 
Tell me about some of your childhood singing experiences. Oh, well, I went to a summer camp uh, near Brattleboro, Vermont, Camp Arden, named after the Forest of Arden, where I learned Shakespeare. And one year, I was sent my father's song that he wrote to a William Blake poem, The Lamb. And uh, I was going to save that for the trip to Toledo. Right. We will, we will. I have a place in the interview where you were going to sing that. Okay. Um, did you ever sing in a chorus or a church choir, uh, community choruses or church choirs? Did you ever sing? Oh, yes. Yes. In uh, Westchester, I sang in the church choir. And as I was a smoker, I was singing tenor there for a while. <laughs> That's about uh, all I can say on that. But in childhood, of course, I went to church uh, with my mother. She was the devout church woman. Right. And uh, would sometimes join the choir. And she always did a pageant, a Christmas pageant, with the Christ child in the crib. And the children came up and gave the, their oranges to the Christ child baby. And, you know, we right. did all of those things. And my mother was also, every year, read... Twelfth Night by Shakespeare, and she played all the parts. <laughs> I think she was more talented than I was. I really do. Wow. I want to ask you a little later about your, your mother's um, theatrical um, talents. All right. A um, couple questions about your, your family. Um, so your full name is Sarah Emerson Farwell, Farwell, and you were born in 1923 in Santa Barbara, California. No, I was born in Pasadena, California. Oh, that's... <laughs> okay, the biography that I read was, was wrong. Oh, maybe uh, Evelyn Culbertson didn't get that one right yep. in the bio. There's some other inaccuracies in that, that biography as well. Uh -huh. She was a lovely woman, though. Uh -huh. she, I guess she's still she did, with us. Right, she did a tremendous... Thing, uh, uh, the big job. Yeah, of, she had, she's the one. She's just a moment to tell about how she got those all the works that were sold at auction from a friend right. who knew that she was a music teacher and she would love to see all this. Right. And otherwise, it would have all been lost to the world. Right. All of father's papers, and uh, so Evelyn is the one who had the effort, the interest and the ability to write the biography, which is called He Heard America Singing, right. Arthur Farwell. Right, and that's a and tremendous that um, thing that's, that she did. Um, that's not family life, though. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, we'll digress a little bit, and we'll just come back. Um, so you told me the other day you were married to uh, to um, Cy Milbert. Is that short? F um, f is that Seymour? Short, short for Seymour. Okay. Seymour Milbert. Okay. Okay. And that marriage lasted 15 years, and uh, he remarried and moved back to uh, where he loved a, another woman and married again, and uh, he died in, in Germany. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 And he wouldn't go back to the original name, which was Milikovsky, which I thought was, should have been our married name. Uh huh. Because, but at Ellis Island, his parents, you know, they changed the name. I, like so many Milbert people do. Yeah. Saying, but Milikovsky is beautiful, you yes, know. Yes, it is. So your mother was also named Sarah, Sarah Wire Farwell. Um, I was named after my grandmother, Sarah Wire. Right. She's the connection to Ralph Waldo Emerson, I right. think. Right. Um, and she, was she, she was second generation. I'm third generation. My children are fourth generation cousins of Ralph Waldo. Right. And you said that you called, uh, you referred to him as Uncle Waldo. Is that correct? Oh, yes. Yeah. He was always called Cousin Waldo or in cousin. our family. Yeah. Okay. Um, then there's the... Um, uh, because of Ralph Walter Emerson, that's your middle name and your brother is named Emerson, right? Just so, Emerson uh, Farwell. Yeah, right. But my eldest brother, Bryce Farwell, is the one who did the most wonderful work for my father. Right. By writing a, a whole catalog of his work. That's a tremendous thing that he did. And I think you have that, don't we, you? We certainly do yeah. at the library here. Arthur's second cousin was... 
Abby Farwell Brown, a author and playwright and poet. Abby Farwell Brown, um, it was your Arthur's second cousin. Do you, were you familiar with her work? Not at all. Okay. I don't even know her name. Okay, I just wondered. Sorry. Yeah. Dad okay. didn't talk about her. Why? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I've got a lot of talk with my father. We were close friends. Uh-huh. Okay, and then just the names of your siblings. There's Bryce. Beat. Bryce. Yeah. Arthur. Both gone now. Uh, Beatrice, right. my elder sister, then me, I was number four, Sarah Emerson, right. and uh, two more, Emerson Farwell and baby was Jonathan Farwell, right. no longer baby. We're all in our 70s <laughs> and 80s now. Right. And then I, you had a, um, I guess, a, a stepsister, Cynthia? Yes. Right. right. Dad married again. Right. Men do that, you know. <laughs> uh, and uh, they had a child. He married Betty Richardson. And uh, they had Cynthia Farwell. Right. 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 Okay. Um, getting on to the life of Arthur Farwell. Um, his dates are 1872 to 1952. Yes. He was born in St. Paul, Minnesota, and died in New York City. Um, I'm going to give just a, a couple, say a couple things about his background. He was born in St. Paul, um, and when he was a child, he took violin lessons and he played um, with his brother Sidney, yes, who played the he piano. He played the violin as a child, but he went to MIT not to become a musician. That's right. Um, he wanted to become. An electrical like, engineer. That's right. Um, and he had that lifelong uh, interest, and as a child, um, interest in engineering and, and photography. Um, photography. He right. made his own camera. Yeah. Right, right. Um, the summer before he came to MIT, he talks about in his autobiography of um, playing some, some Schubert with some, some people playing chamber music. Oh, at home, in East Lansing. Those oh. are the years... From 1928 to 1936. Well, no, this was before he came to MIT. Oh, before MIT. Before MIT, he played Schubert chamber music with some people, and it, that's what sparked his interest in music. Before he came to MIT. Oh. He said that I was don't a that was that, that, that was a, that was told a, me what sparked. He said it was falling in love with the Boston Symphony when and, he was at MIT. Right, and then when he came to MIT and went to the Boston Symphony concerts, that furthered his interest in music. Oh, that that it was that was his deciding change. Right. He wanted to devote his life to music. Right. From the hearing what was happening at the BSO. Right. And I guess he had gotten this interest that you've explained earlier. Right. So he was at MIT from 1889 to 1893, and he got a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. Yes, and, he said he almost flunked out. Right. But he, had, he gave us a very funny story about uh, he was a DKE fraternity. Right. And they would sing... We are three frogs, sat on three logs. We all went a wink at them, a skink at them, a skitty eye to ink at them, a rip, die, squeeze them, bump. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that's correct? That's okay. There's a shock mount on the microphone there, so you don't have to okay. worry about that. Uh, yeah. I got that so that people could pound on the table. <laughs> okay. Um, his senior thesis was called Experiments on the Least Number of Vibrations Necessary to Determine Pitch. Say that again. Okay, his Arthur's senior thesis at MIT was called Experiments on the Least Number of Vibrations Necessary to Determine Pitch. Oh, that explains a lot to me. Yes. He had friends among physicists. Right. The two in California that he knew, I don't know their names. I know one, uh, Dr. Hale, H-A-L-E. And that's probably why after the marriage they went to California because of this intense interest yes. in, in uh, what science was doing. But of course, I'm no scientist and I didn't follow that kind of thinking very well. Yeah. Are there any more? I, I love science. I think it does wonderful things, but anyway. Right, well, I'm not a scientist either, so. <laughs> okay. 
Are there any other stories that um, your father told you about his MIT um, experience? Any students that he told you about, professors? Oh, yes, there was Rudolf Gott. That's right. Uh, who was a pianist. He was a pianist and, and a composer. Right. But he didn't, he had a theme that he left to dad. I guess he must have died young. He did. I'm sorry. That's and I don't know when the symphony was written. I forgot the date on that. I can get, I can get that for you later. Were there any other stories from from MIT that um, that that he told you about? You know? I think he was just so interested in the music by then that uh, he didn't tell stories. Uh, he did entertain us at dinner a lot mm -hmm. with the. MIT, but I think the hazing that went on there was really something dreadful, too. Wow. I don't know what he had to go through to I, join the, fra the fraternity. Uh-huh. So, did he talk about um, any music uh, that he did when he was a st an MIT student, any groups that he played in? Um, he wasn't. A, he had must have waited till he got out of MIT to even study music uh -huh. seriously. Because he was playing he, the violin. He showed. He showed his first works to McDowell, and right. McDowell encouraged him. Right. And uh, after MIT, he started going to New York and meeting people. And in 1901, he began the Wawan Press. That's right. And which in which. He must have had a pretty wide influence because the Wawan Press published for 10 years works of other American composers and his own works, too. That's correct. So, uh, you know, you spoke to me about influence once, and I didn't handle it. And uh, his influence was much wider than I realized on the whole general picture of music in that period because... Toward the end of his life, when we were both in New York City, we went to a concert together once, and as we were looking for our seats, a man behind us said, there goes the father of American music. I was very proud to hear that, but I was also, also being very young and sophisticated, so I didn't pay any attention. <laughs> but, of course, I was impressed. Right. And so perhaps we should all be a little impressed with Arthur Farwell. I hope so. Absolutely. Are there any stories that he told you about going to Boston Symphony concerts? Any particular um, pieces that he heard, you know, artists that he heard that he told you about that were memorable? Well, I don't know when The Rite of Spring was written by Stravinsky. That would have been 1913, yes. The 19th century? Nin, 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 1913. So he might have heard that, because he had a big reaction to that one. Yes. He wrote The Blight of Spring. Right. <laughs> which is very funny to right. me. Right, that's part of his comic because opera. the music, the original Stravinsky, is gorgeous and tragic and haunting. Yeah. But uh, apparently he wrote something else quite right. different <laughs> called The Blight of Spring. Piero's... Lunacy? Right. Uh, that's, a, that's a parody on the, uh, Schoenberg's Pierre Lunaire. Right. Those are part of his opera called Cartoon. Is it in his opera Cartoon? Yes. I, uh, I have heard the songs right. from the opera. At Hartford College, they were done by student singers. Right. And uh, it's, it should be produced. It's a wonderful story. Right. It's the story of a young composer... American composer having trouble getting published, which of course was his experience. Right. And uh, there's a love interest, and there are funny songs about, and uh, one of them is, Americus comes with an opus, but of course he's <laughs> turned down. Right. So I, I can't remember those songs at all, but uh, right. they, it was a good experience to hear. The and music even, of the opera. Right. And I wish somebody would produce it. 
even Beethoven makes a, an appearance in the opera. He's a character in the opera. Oh, yes. I think they kind of get mad at Beethoven. They want to see America have music. And there's wild Indians in it, and they hoop around. And, uh, of course, Dad wrote very beautiful Indian arrangements of right. Indian songs early on in his career as a composer. But uh, there's also cowboys in the opera. So you know, they come running onto the stage, and, and uh, I don't know what happens to Beethoven, but he's yeah. not there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> they, they replace him. Oh, I'm a little shouting here. I'm You're sorry. doing just fine. So when your father was at MIT, he also heard the Metropolitan Opera in Boston. Did he talk about that with you? I think he was a spear holder in the opera there for a while. He probably had to make some money. Another thing he made money doing at MIT was doing other people's astrology charts. He understood that art. Wow. Wow. So he actually made some money with that. Yeah. <laughs> so after he finished MIT, um, he first studied music theory with somebody named Homer Norris. Did he tell you about Homer Norris? I've heard the name. Uh-huh. Uh, is that after MIT? That was after MIT. Yeah, see, I never knew, and I'm very glad to learn that that's what he did, how he got his studies going. Right. Because eventually he went to Europe. I think that's after he met Thomas Osborne. Right, right. And, and that was down near Oswego somewhere. Oswego, in New, York, New York. In New York. Right. Yeah, he's, he writes music when he's there, too. And uh, Osborne... Who was also a pianist. Provided the finances for him to go to Europe and study with Humperdinck. Right. And we'll get to that in just a minute. Okay. So after he studied music theory with Homer Norris, then he studied composition with George Chadwick and Edward, Edward McDowell here in Boston. Edward yeah. McDowell? Well, right. yes, it was McDowell who was encouraging him. That's yeah. right. Right. Did he tell you any stories about studying with Chadwick or McDowell? I've heard the name. I, I really can't uh, answer that well. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure he must have enjoyed studying with him, right? Right. He certainly did, and he was very fond of them. When um, He made uh, wonderful friendships, you know. He certainly throughout did. Throughout his life, yes. When um, Arthur was still here in Boston, um, and he would make these trips to New York, um, the composer Antonin Dvorak was in New York, um, oh, he was yes. director of the, the... Oh, I meant to tell you about that. Right. Let me, when, he just, was back and forth between Boston and New York because his Wawan Press was published out of Newton, Massachusetts. That's correct. And his father had a house there, and he stayed there. And uh, then he, in New York, he started to work as a music critic with Musical America. That's correct. I think he signed that as Mephistopheles. <laughs> <laughs> that was a monthly column, I guess. Right. So I want to backtrack just a little bit. When, um, um, during um, 1892 to 1895, Antonin Dvorak was director of the National Conservatory in New York. Um, and and the, all the young composers went to hear him talk. All the young American composers. Right. At Cooper Union. Yes. Right. And you said that was in 1893, is that correct? Is that what I don't it? know the oh. year. It okay. sounds right. You mentioned on the phone the other day. But he would have graduated from MIT. That's and right. Writing music. Right. So it's awfully close. Maybe it was later. I don't know. Anyway, and what he heard from... I wonder, is it all right yes. to talk about what... Yes. What... Uh, uh, Dvorak advised the young composers to do, go out to your indigenous people, your American Indians, your cowboys, your people in uh, Appalachia and the southern folk song singers, and get your American material. He, in that lecture, did not predict jazz. My father predicted it later. About nine, well, I don't know. 1901, he was already doing Wawan Press. Right. So it may have been then that he predicted that he wrote an article about how jazz was, I guess, coming up from New Orleans. Right. Oh. But it was not his. There's always been popular music and serious music. And of course, we were all taught to love serious music. 
much more. Although as teenagers, we all adored the pop stuff too. Right. But uh, I don't think Dvorak predicted the jazz. Not he, yet. He no. didn't mention that. So. All right. Um, so your so, your so dad took his advice. Right? He absolutely did. He was one of the first American composers to, to really take that advice and really be an advocate for making American music. Um, absolutely. He was way. an advocate and a helper to all the other composers with the Wawan Press. Wawan means peace. There was a Wawan ceremony. It's a peace ceremony. So making peace with music, I guess. And... Uh, that was an Indian ceremony right? for peace. So during um, 1897 through 1899, he studied in Europe, um, um, funded by his, his friend Thomas Mott Osborne. Um, and he first went to Germany and studied with Engelbert Hump Humperdinck in 1897, who's famously known as the composer of the opera Hansel and Gretel. Listen, you don't need me here at all. You know more than I know. It's wonderful. <laughs> Anyways, did he tell you stories about working with Humperdinck? He was very fond of him. Who was? Your father was very fond of Humperdinck. Did he? Oh, yes. Did he tell you about studying with him? No. He just said he did. Okay. Okay. Also, when he was in Germany... He may have talked to his colleagues much mm -hmm. more about Humperdinck and yeah. about Fitzner. He was in, right. in Hans, France. Right, yeah. Hans Fitzner. That was actually also in Germany. Um, he studied with, um, he studied in Paris, and we'll get to that in a second, but Fitzner was, that was in, um, in Germany as well. Um, and while he was studying with Fitzner, he met a poet, James Grun. Did he talk about that? His friendship with James Grun? A friend? Yeah. He met the, the poet James Grun in Berlin. Well, he didn't talk about him to me. Okay, because <laughs> James Grun also encouraged your father to, to use Native American sources in his music as well. Oh, well, Dad did so many beautiful Indian songs, right. haunting ones, R short ones and longer ones. Oh, they're gorgeous, I think. So, in your, did your father tell you anything about studying with Hans Fitzner? Any stories about that? Oh, just, just the one of sitting on the steps of Notre Dame and munching a whole bunch of goodies that they got at the nearby pastry shop, sat there eating them all night. <laughs> 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 but he, uh, he did write a long, thin, much longer thing. He called it his Vanderhara. Right, right. That's an and autobiography. I've never read that. I don't know. There's some great stuff in there. That's where I'm getting some be. of this information to ask you questions. You'll have I to read get that. me a copy and somebody will read it to me. <laughs> right. When he was in Germany, he went to Bayreuth and heard Wagner operas. Did he tell you about that? He loved Wagner operas. He heard them all there. Right. Where they're done. Yes, that's true. He did talk a lot about Wagner. But I was so unmusical, I can't tell you what he was saying, except I do know that he was also criticized for sounding Wagnerian sometimes uh -huh. in some things. And uh, Dad would say, well, we all stand on the shoulders of somebody, you know. And uh, he honored Wagner's work. And he told me the whole story. Parsifal story, or was it, uh, what's another Wagner opera? Oh, God of Damarun, or, um, um, no, where the, the Ride of the Valkyries, Ireland, they're in love, Tristan and his old. Oh, yes. Okay. Isn't that Wagner? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Did he have any particular favorite Wagner operas? Well, when I was taken from my boarding school to hear Tristan and Isolde in New York City with some great singers, um, I went on down to my father's apartment on 12th Street in New York, and he sat down and played through the whole first act of Tristan and Isolde on his piano. My. Oh, 
It was wonderful that he knew it. Absolutely. Were there other favorite operas of his, other favorite Wagner operas? Do you remember? Parsifal. Uh huh. <coughs> Probably all of them. Mm hmm. And the, who's, who's that woman who sings and, and makes fun of the. Oh, Anna, of the Anna, Anna, Anna Russell. <coughs> Russell? An, Anna Russell. Russell. I'm, Russell, R U S S E L. I never met her, but I have heard her do yes. her takeoff of Wagner, and it is superb. I, it makes me very happy. To yes, use that. right. It's very right. funny stuff. Right, um, and then after he studied in Germany, then he went to Paris in 1899 and studied with um, Alexander Goulamont, uh, the noted organist in Paris. I'll repeat that again. In 1899, he went to Paris and studied counterpoint with Alexander Guillemont. Guillemont. Guillemont, okay. I'm Guillemont. glad I didn't know how to pronounce yeah, that. So I, don't, I, I don't know much about that. <coughs> okay. Um, but I'm glad he did because he, he, he really knew his stuff, my father. People are awfully impressed for, if they're musicians looking at his work. Right, he, right. He clearly knew. I have a friend who's a composer in Arizona in my years there, and uh, he said, well, your father really knew his orchestration. He really did. So what, who was that composer? What was his name? Stern. Uh, Jacob Stern. Okay. He's in Tucson. Okay. Yeah. He's working on an opera, too, I think. I don't know what he's doing right now, but he's a, he's a very, very good friend. His wife is a beautiful painter, and she's my good friend. Um, in 1900, your father um, came across a book by Alice Fletcher called Indian Story and Song from North America. Did he tell you about when he first um, saw that book and how it affected him? What is the book? Indian Story and Song from North America by Alice Fletcher. Oh, well, he knew Alice Fletcher. They worked together sometimes, I think. And uh, before the time of round, flat records, there were... Wax cylinders. Wax something. It's, it's the wax cylinders. Cylinders. Right. And uh, they could record on those. Right. And uh, Alice Fletcher was doing that, too. I think they maybe made a trip together. I have no idea if they uh -huh. actually did, but they were good friends. And what else? I don't know. When he first saw her book, there were transcriptions of some of the Indian songs in the book. And that's... I never saw the book. Uh-huh. I wish I had when I could do my reading. Yes. Um, did he tell you any stories about working with, with um, Alice Fletcher? Well, he talked about her a good bit. I probably wasn't listening very well. That's okay. Uh, he made. Um, he was. I'm sure he must have been fond of her, because yeah. they were doing similar work, right? Right, right. I'm just checking the tape recorder here. Okay. Um, after that, um, he made four um, Western trips to study Indian music and Spanish American music and between 1903 and 1907. Oh, that's a wonderful trip. He talked a lot about that. Right. And he met he, somebody. By this time, had learned piano and played his own works, Indian and uh, the California uh, songs in Spanish American songs. Right. And you can buy that at the Loomis Museum in uh, Los Angeles. I did that. I went out in Los Angeles to uh, the Loomis Estate and there you could buy copies of the California uh, Spanish American songs by my father. Primavera is one of them. Uh, that's a beautiful one. Fantastic. And that was Charles F. Loomis, who was an archaeologist and writer on the American Southwest. Let's try again here. You were referring to Charles F. Loomis, who was an archaeologist um, and writer on the American Southwest. Um, they were good friends, they right? They were very good friends. His picture that I showed you is taken in front of the, in fact, I've given it to MIT. It was taken in front of the Loomis estate which he himself built, Loomis. 
and they were very good friends, and that was when he was friends with the physicists also, and I think he had a, a little stretch at Berkeley teaching. But then, of course, by 1928, we all ended up in East Lansing, Michigan. Right, and we'll get to that shortly. All right. Um, did your father tell you stories about collecting Indian songs and, um, and some of the, the tribes that he visited? Did he tell you stories about that? Well, I know of a picture of him with a headdress on, an Indian headdress sitting among some Indians. I don't know where what's become of it. It might be at the Sibley uh, Library in Eastman School. Right, where his papers are. Um, right. That's where all his works went, uh, finally. Uh, we, we went there to the Rochester School. Right. And there, we had a weekend there where it was all presented to him. All the manuscripts and books and anything was given to that library. I wish he'd, I wish MIT had them, because <laughs> now I'm here. <laughs> I'd love to have another look at them. But we did spend a weekend there. Right. Did your father sing any of the Indian songs that he knew to you? Well, we used to do the Navajo War Dance. I'll do it for you if there were any room on this floor. Hey, 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 the audience stared, stood up and cheered and clapped like crazy. His work was much better understood in Europe <laughs> than it has been here. <laughs> Did your father tell any of the, the Indian stories that he learned, some of the myths and stories? Did he tell any of those to you? He must have, but they would have been part of the childhood <clears throat> storytelling. Excuse me. I don't know how you can bring this together because I lost my voice for a moment. We'll be fine. We'll be just fine. And uh, <clears throat> surely he told us some stories, but I don't remember them. That's okay. <laughs> One of the things that um, your father was known for and still known today, they refer to him as an Indian Indianist composer, but there was much more that he did than that, and oh, that sometimes, and, fr of and, course, and, he and, was got very insulted when he was called an Indianist because he thought that was just an early part of his work. Right, he continued to write many in many forms, only the one symphony, the Rudolf Gott Symphony. That's correct, which has been done by Walnut Creek Symphony Orchestra, and I think my brother Bryce had it in recording. And I'd I like to hear that sometime. I don't know if it, it still exists, but we could find out. I'll have to ask you it about that. It would be that. there in Eastman. Right. Um, so, as you mentioned earlier, the Wawan Press, that went from 1901 to 1912. When it uh, was sold to Shermers. Right. They didn't do a thing with it. Right. When he was working on the press, he worked with a fellow composer, Henry F. Gilbert. Did he tell you much about Gilbert? It sounds very familiar. It's ringing bells, but I don't know what. Okay. They both had similar ideas about American music, and they were both interested in Indian music. Oh, Gilbert? He was. was. His name? Yes. Henry? Henry F. Gilbert. Henry F. Gilbert. I right. It rings bell, but I'm not connecting. Sorry. Right. <laughs> um, and as you mentioned, the um, Wawan Press was sold to, to um, G. Shermer, the publisher, um, but they, as you said, they didn't do much with, no, with that after much that. With it. In um, 1909, your father moved to, to New York, uh, where he was critic, music critic for um, the, the magazine Musical America. Um, he was also supervisor of municipal 
um, concerts in the parks and piers, and director of the Third Street oh, Music that School. Was, uh, the early period. Right. When uh, this is before the wedding, even. And That's he right. Was uh, running the, uh, the all the music in the parks of New York. New York City. Right. And there he did a very big pageant in 1916 for the 300th anniversary of Shakespeare's, of Shakespeare's death. Right. 1916. We'll, okay. Right. We'll, we'll get to that in a, in a, in a I have okay. some questions about that. We'll get there. Um, it was during his time as, as a music critic for Musical America that he met the composer pianist Sergei Rachmaninoff. Um, he had Rachmaninoff was uh, introduced to New York by my father. Right. Right. He um, wrote a very favorable favorable review of the Third Piano Concerto in 1910, and that led to their friendship, from what I've read. Um, oh well, you know more than I do. <laughs> That's okay with me. Later, um, um, you were telling me that you were introduced to Rachmaninoff um, when Arthur oh, was back in New York. Oh, back in New York, in the later part of Dad's life. Right. Yes, Rachmaninoff played in New York. I think he had his granddaughter with him. And I met her, and I met him, and he was beautiful. Elderly, long, sad face. Beautiful man and a great composer. Right. Do, you, do you have any more recollections of that meeting? Just that we went to the, went backstage and met him and, mm -hmm. and uh, his granddaughter, whoever was with him. No? You know one doesn't. You just go out and have coffee and cake and stuff. Sure, sure. <laughs> you were also telling me a story that you had heard another performance, a solo piano performance of Rachmaninoff, and then you wrote to your father about it. Oh, that was back in, in uh, school when I was, uh, you know, thing, being a smarty. We were taken to concerts from our boarding school, so I did hear him then. And I remember writing to, to Dad and saying, well, I didn't think he was that great. <laughs> <laughs> and Dad wrote back and said, well, it may have been an off night. <laughs> <laughs> Eleanor Duza had off nights, you know, great actress. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I'm sure that was just me being s snooty. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to be smarty. All right. So um, your father, Arthur Farwell, was deeply involved nationally in the community pageant movement, which lasted from about 1910 through the mid-1920s, and he was a founding member of the American Pageant Association, which started in 1913. Well, he did so much work in the pageant, uh, which was popular in that early period there. That's right. Uh, for quite a while, one big pageant after another. There was one my mother was in in California, it was a very famous one where she played a nun. It was a whole Christian thing. Right, they're called the, the, the pilgrimage. Um, I forgot what that's oh, called. it's all right. We we'll, don't have to I'll get the remember name of that. the name of it. But he also worked with Percy Mackay. Mackay would write the pageant, the script, and Dad would do the music. Right, and they both had um, ideas about pageants becoming a new American art form. Um, they saw this as a chance to make... Um, Put America on the map? Right. For um, its music and its pageantry? Right, but also saw pageants as a, as a, as an art, as a theatrical art form that was different from, from, oh, from yeah. stuff in the theater. And it well, was, it is. And we don't do them now anymore, that I see anyway. Uh, and when Dad was teaching at Michigan State in East Lansing, we would go to a, a summer festival kind of a thing that they'd have on the Red Cedar River, and he would just shake his head and say, if you wish you, wish you had seen a real pageant, you know. Right. Because <laughs> he had finished with those by the 40s. 
So you mentioned um, Percy Mackay, and that's um, the last name is spelled M A C K A Y E. Looks Percy like Mackay was yeah, what his right. Name was. It looks like Mackay, but it's pronounced yes. Mackay. Right. He was a playwright and a, and a poet. He lived from 1875 to 1956, and two of the big pageants that um, that your father worked with him on. There was the St. Louis Pageant and Mask in 1914, and then one called Caliban by the Yellow Sands. Oh, that was the one we heard about, Caliban. That was the big one for Shakespeare, 300th anniversary. Right. And that was it must have been fabulous. So he, they had Isadora Duncan, the very great dancer. That's right. Dance through, down through the whole stadium from the back of it to the front. I think a stadium is usually for sports events. Right. Well, you can imagine that that scene and then the scenes were done down at the end and they were scenes from the tempest in caliban of course right <laughs> and, uh, and dad had a whole ring around the top of the stadium uh with trumpets placed here and there and they announced the thing beginning i guess and imagine trying to get that time they had a telephone hookup so that all the different parts of the, the stadium they were coordinating things with, with telephones. Well, that's wonderful that you know so much, <laughs> Forrest. It's lovely. <laughs> and there were thousands and thousands of people who went to these these um, these pageants, and they got lots of press. Um, but what's interesting is that both Percy... They got very good reviews. Yes. Right, right. Um, and a year later, um, Caliban was also produced in Cambridge, Massachusetts at Harvard Stadium. I never knew that. Yeah. You're teaching me about my own father's <laughs> work. That's great. Well, you're a music person, of course. Did your father tell you any stories about working with Percy Mackay and what he was like, what, 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 was, what it was like working with him? I guess he must have loved it. He always was so enthusiastic about anything he was doing. He wouldn't have done it if he didn't believe in Mackay. Right. He must have loved him very much. They both um, were very idealistic people who... Yeah, big idealists. Right. Um, and wanted America to be a big thing in music and theater. That's right. Um, so in, in 1917, your mother married Gert... Or your father married Gertrude Bryce. In 1917. Right. right. That's right, because the babies came right after that, 17... They began in, Bryce was 1918, Art was 1919, B was 1920, and then I came along finally right, in 23 in California. Right. But uh, Bryce was born in New York. Oh. That was before they went to California. Okay. Um, so um, your um, mother Gertrude was um, an, an actress. She was born in Lima, Ohio. Um, and then she went to a drama school in Cleveland. In Cleveland, studied with the, the father of Tyrone Power, who was a very big movie star. Oh, okay. Yeah. And he said to her one day, she was trying to do the, you know, the maid making the bed in uh, Othello. Um, I forget her name in the play. Um, and she said, Mr. Power says, you're making the bed as if there were crumbs in it. <laughs> <laughs> so that was her story about studying acting. But Excuse yeah, me a minute. Somebody's, very talented. somebody's knocking on the door here. Just a minute. Okay, we're re resuming talking about your, your mother and, and Tyrone Power. We uh, did that. Yeah, okay. Um, and then um, after that, she moved to, to New York to work in the theater. Um, she had the same struggle with the theater that I had later, but she said I did more with theater than she did. Uh huh. She was uh, very serious, of course, but she was also very talented, and I'm sorry. She was beautiful. She certainly was more beautiful than I was, but she uh, used to say to me when I was grown up and doing some work in the theater in stock and so on, and she's saying, well, you did more with it than I did. And I don't think so because she went on doing anything she could think of. She started something called the Intimate Theater in which she would invite people into the house in Michigan. And uh, 
she would do a play all herself. And, uh, and we kids were a little bit embarrassed by this, but uh, she, she was very brave. Well, was that, a, was that a regular thing, the intimate theater? Not very regular. Uh -huh. It was rare, uh -huh. but it happened at least six times, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Who was involved in that? Was it um, friends of hers and people in the community? Oh, she was known in the community. She was a big time ch church woman and uh, sang in the choir. She would uh, leave early Sunday morning, put the roast in the oven, and Dad would make us flapjacks. Right. <laughs> Sunday <laughs> breakfast. He'd learned them at the lumber camp in Maine that he loved. He loved being there when he was younger. I don't know when. Uh -huh. And uh, Mother was down at church, and she would get home in time to make Sunday dinner. But she was known in the community. She worked with the... Uh, whatever the drama league was downtown in Lansing, Michigan. We lived in East Lansing, uh -huh. but the uh, community theater was in Lansing. So she was involved very much in the community. Very theater. much involved. She played a lot of parts. They did uh, oh, O'Neill plays, you know, serious plays. Mm -hmm. She directed for them. She did, my goodness, what was the Shakespeare play she did? And I was in it. I was Fleance. That's Macbeth. She directed Macbeth. Wow, so you were involved in that. I was a little kid and I played Fleance. <laughs> oh. Did you do any other community theater productions there in, in Lansing? I didn't. Uh huh. She did. Others. Uh, right. And apparently, your mother, Gertrude, also went to a, a performance of Caliban. The, the 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 pageant. I think it's about then that she met Dad. Right. And uh, they they really actually formally met at a party in Long Island, given by Kirk Bryce. His name was Kirkpatrick Bryce, and they all called him Cousin Kirk. So, I have a brother named Jonathan Kirkpatrick Farwell. Yeah. So, so Kirk was important in their life. He's the one who gave them the Mason and Hamlin piano at their wedding. Oh my! And that's the one we grew up with that in the living room, <laughs> along with Beethoven's portrait on the wall in the living room, who scowled down right at you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Beethoven scared me, of course, he's my favorite composer. But <laughs> hmm. As children, you know, you have your own reactions as a child. So in um, 1918, the family moved to, to California, and your father was associate professor of music at the University of California at Berkeley from... At Berkeley. That right. I was right. Yes. That's right. Um, 1918... Correct. ...to 1918, 1918 through 1919. Um, um, and also while, um, um, I guess, after that, he organized the Santa Barbara Community Chorus... That's where my sister was born. He, uh, the, the family was living there um, in Santa Barbara, and he did a beautiful thing with that chorus, I think, still exists. Fantastic. That he began. He was, that's why uh, Evelyn always chose the title of the book about him. He heard America singing. He right. was always starting singing groups. Right. He was very involved in the, the whole nationwide community chorus movement, spoke about it at, at conferences, and was a real advocate for that. He was also um, instrumental in organizing the Santa Barbara School for the Arts. I don't know. Okay. I wasn't it, born yet. Yeah. Okay. What did I know? Right. Then there was something called Theater of the Stars um, oh, on Big Bear Lake. From 1925. There's my very first memory. I was crawling on gravel, getting away from the tin tub they'd given me a bath in. And that was up in Big Bear Lake, Fawnskin. Yeah, that's right. Which is just above what the town down at the bottom of the hill. I, I forget, San Bernardino or something. Uh huh. It's down there. And uh, that. Theater of the Stars, there are pictures of that, and I think there's an article about it somewhere, right. but I don't have it to give right. you. I wish I did. And it was a natural amphitheater. Yes, I found it much yeah. later. In yeah. 90, 1991 or two, I went down 
to Big Bear Lake with a friend of mine who drove a lot. And uh, we drove all the way up to Fawnskin at Big Bear Lake. And you see the lake, but behind there, there's woods. And it's all natural. And we found the where the benches where the audience sat. They were still there, kind of broken. But you could see, look across and see the, the rise in the hillside there where the actors in the Theater of the Stars stood. There is a photograph of my mother in costume in one of those things. Wow, wow. And I, of course, was too young to take in the, any of what they were doing, but the, the he got the San Francisco Symphony people to come out and play music there. That's right. So I, I thought that was pretty impressive work. We'll take care of that later. That's okay. Also, while um, he was in um, California, there were some other um, pageants. There was a, the um, Pilgrimage Play, 1921, and the Pageant of Liberty. Do you know, did, did he tell you about those? It must have been the first one you've mentioned. Uh -huh. My mother was the nun in Pilgrimage. Right, right. and that she was... She to ring a bell, but I don't know about the other. Right. But it, that's when Dad saw what a real pageant was like. Mm -hmm. And then how he could criticize in Michigan at what little things they were doing. Right. <clears throat> um, and just to remind us, um, you were born in um, 1923 there. Um, your mother wrote a play called Baby's First Christmas Tree, and your father wrote the music for that. Do oh, you... yes, the evergreen tree is what we called it. Oh, the evergreen tree. And okay. I, uh, I produced that once in the house we lived in in New York. And that, uh, it's lovely. There's a, some good carols in it that Dad wrote. As Joseph I was walking, I heard an angel sing, This night shall be the birth night of Christ our heavenly King. I think that's Dad's. Wow. I can't promise you. I haven't seen the, the music for that. At some point, I would really like but to. But it's charming. Uh, it, it starts with a bunch of animals uh, all talking to each other. Uh, somebody is coming. Somebody is coming. Somebody is coming. Somebody is coming. Who can it be? Who can it be? And I guess it's Joseph and Mary and the baby. I can't remember very well, but uh, uh, we, we were able to do some of it. The other thing I did with Mother there was a Dickens thing. Christmas Carol with the Scrooge. Yes, right, of course. And his dead friend who comes up and Mother played the ghost and I played Scrooge. Wow. <laughs> well, we did things for people around, neighbors and things. Uh -huh. So this was we at the house? E this was at the house in East Lansing, right? Or, yeah. No, this is New York City when she was quite old. I see. And uh, I was into theater stuff that I was doing. Okay. And teaching. So we're going to backtrack just a little bit. It was in 1927 that the, your family moved to East Lansing, Michigan. Your father was invited to head the theory composition section of the newly organized music department of the Michigan Agricultural College, which yes, is now known as Michigan State University. Michigan State University. Right. You're correct. Right. And, uh, of course, we called it the Cow College because it was an agricultural college. Uh -huh. So we could get around that way. And but, it was, uh, he, of course, did very wonderful work there. He certainly did. And he was composing. He would come, I would run out to meet him. I was about nine, eight, nine, ten then. And uh, if I were home from school and not out playing with my pals, I would see him coming and run out. And, and we would meet out in the street, and he, we would hold hands, swing hands, and he would sing songs. And uh, they'd be like, Nita, wa, Nita, ask your soul if you should, if we should part, 
And Daisy, Daisy, give me, give me your answer true. Uh -huh. I'm half crazy, all for the love of you. So there and were some popular songs that... come in, and he'd yeah. go upstairs to compose, and I would go ba bake cakes in the kitchen and use up all mother's eggs on what I called gold cake. <laughs> <laughs> then I would take some cupcakes up to Dad in his attic study where he was working, and he would be either composing or he would be uh, working on his drawings of his visions, which we should... We will get to talk, that. Talk we will get about. to that. Uh, and then he would uh, he would always stop for me, and I would need something for school, like from a magazine, and he'd help me find it. He was so helpful. He was so delightful to be around as a human being. That's what he taught me. His influence on me wasn't music. It was how to be a human being mm -hmm. and be thoughtful and be kind and be helpful. You know, all those good things about being a human. I learned those things from Dad. So you were telling me about these music sessions at the house where your father invited musicians to come and play. Oh, yes, yes. Occasionally, on Sunday afternoons, he would get colleagues to come over. And uh, there was one, Michael Press, who I think had the cello. And they would bring their instruments and, you know, play different chamber music stuff. And Michael Press would say, Father, why do you write such difficult music? <laughs> <laughs> and others have said that, too. I heard it the other day from somebody trying to play for me the, one of the Emily Dickinson songs, and she said the accompaniment is very intricate. She owns a Steinway piano, but uh -huh. she doesn't play very well, and she's uh, a good friend, a very nice gal. And uh, she knows she doesn't play terribly well, but she played me a, a Beethoven bagatelle. So she knows something about music. So when she saw this, she said the accompaniment is very intricate. Right. So. And those Dickinson songs um, are some of the some of his very finest work. Uh, but they're beautiful. They oh, really they are. are beautiful. Right. Um, so these musicians that came to the house, were they faculty members at the college? They were colleagues, yes. Uh -huh. They were also teachers at the college. Mm -hmm. And the concerts I went to, uh, he took me very often to something at the college. He also took me. Uh, he would take us one at a time to uh, hear a local concert, either at college or downtown in Lansing when there were touring musicians. Mm -hmm. That was where I first heard cello uh, concert, and I was very impressed with the cello. I loved it. If I ever studied an instrument, I decided it would be a cello. Do you remember who the cellist was? Was that Michael Press, maybe? No, it wasn't no. Michael Press. It was someone famous touring. I uh -huh. don't remember their name. Uh huh. Do you remember what music um, was on that concert? Oh, no. No. Sorry. That's okay. Don't uh, know music that well. Yeah. Um, are there other concerts that you that he took you to at that time that did you One remember? Of them was one was Gladys Swarthout. Uh huh. She was a singer that was known everywhere. I don't think she did movies, but she uh, toured a lot. Mm hmm. And I was little. I can remember her. She winked at me because I sat down near the front. And Dad would sometimes at these concerts have to get up and stamp his leg down because of a cramp in, the, in his leg. But he would sit again and be, be normal. <laughs> oh, I can't tell you how beautiful a person my father was. He just was a delight to be with. Great company. All his friends knew what a good human being he was, as well as a very fine composer. Do you remember going to concerts at that time of music by your father, hearing performances? No, I don't think there were any. I may be wrong. Is it in the bio? There, there were some at the there college, um, and the Detroit Symphony um, performed um, 
something as well. I forgot which piece it was. Uh, Melody in E minor. Oh, this was the period in East Lansing when Dad bought the lithograph press. Right. And he was so mad at Shermer's for not doing publishing more of his music that he decided he would have to print his own. That's like Walt Whitman. Right. He had to do his own leaves of brass. So he bought a lithograph press. He learned lithography. It was down in the basement, and I got to go and watch him in after-school times. And I mean, there were these wonderful chemical smells. I mean, he had to use his scientific knowledge then just to do it, you know? Right. And he would get all excited about some negative. He'd come running up the stairs to look at it in the sunlight and then bring it down. And the lithography, he did at least five pieces of music. Mm -hmm. I can remember, I think, four of them. Two were Blake poems, The Cradle Song and The Lamb, and um, Land of Luthany, which is, these are all piano works, I think. Right. Melody in E minor, and what the fifth one was, I don't know, and there may have been more, I don't mm -hmm. know. And he also did the artwork for those, not just the, 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 the music. Oh, yes, the covers were very beautifully printed, and he had designed them, and they were in color. I remember the Cradle Song. It was in beautiful big red print. Yeah, he was something of an artist, too. Is it time to tell you about his visions? Um, sure, we can do that. Um, yeah, these mystical visions that he had and the drawings that he made of them. Tell Dad was a visionary and a mystic. He practiced what he called intuition. He even wrote a book about it, which has never been published, and I hope we'll get to that a little we, bit. We will we'll get to that. Um, but what he did, I'll tell you the, the big one, was in Boston Common when he was young. I don't know if he was at MIT or out of it, but he was walking in Boston Common and saw a parade, a musical parade coming. And when the leader of the band pulled out his sword, Dad fell against a tree and I don't know if he was conscious or unconscious, but he had a huge vision. And he has drawn many pictures of that vision. And the first one was the angel. I don't know if she's the angel of death, but she was an angel with a raised sword that was irregular, you know. Um, what do you call that? Curved, a curved sword lifted over a wall, and down below, in the picture he drew, is all of Europe. And it was a prediction of World War I, how all was to be pretty much destroyed. And uh, that was his, and there were many other acts to that vision, I can't tell them to you, but there were, I don't know how long it took him time-wise there in Boston Common, but in the drawings, there are about six drawings of that particular vision. Mm -hmm. And those are some of the things I used to go upstairs to the attic to see what he was doing or take him a piece of cake. And uh, he would be at work. I used to love seeing him just scratching black all over the picture or something that he wanted, like the one in the, which was an intuitional different experience called uh, it was about how should a musician think of God, or how can a musician think of God? And that was the question. And in intuition, you ask a question, and then you get your whole mind quiet, like meditation, and wait. And in that total quiet that you create, which is not easy to do, because our minds never like to stop. If you wait long enough, then an answer will come to you. And uh, there's a great deal more on that subject. But in this picture, 
the answer came this way. Where man's song ends, God's begins. And I think I have to, at this moment, tell you about one of his techniques that he used in writing music was to get his mind all quiet that way, meditative, and then visualize an orchestra. He would already have a theme of some music he was writing, and he wanted to develop it. So he would, in that quiet state, visualize a complete orchestra and ask it to play. He would ask that visualized orchestra to play music, and they did, and did it beautifully, and he would hear it, all of it, harmony and all, and when it was over, he would go immediately to his desk and write it down, the music that he heard from this orchestra. It's hard to imagine such a thing, but mm -hmm. it's true. It was one of the ways he worked. So. That's bad as a visionary. Are there some other things about how his um, visionary process influenced his music? Anything more you want to say about that? I'm sure there were more things. I don't know that I can tell you. I can tell you how he taught me to quiet the mind, which is not an easy thing to do. But in meditation, you must do it. And what he told me to use was an apple tree. And you start by taking off all the apples and throwing them out. And you get rid of all the leaves on the apple tree. And then you get rid of the twigs and then the branches and finally the trunk and then there's nothing. And if you do this carefully enough, you can quiet the mind. But for me, I was left with a theater curtain. And I had to pull the dust off this velvet black curtain and then the light that's under the curtain before it goes up. I suppose it's because I was a theater person. And uh, finally I could get black, the, just the black curtain. And that's when I practiced meditation in my 20s period that's been living out the rest of my life. My. Um, so this was, he could do it probably much faster than what I've described. I don't know how he did it. He probably had other techniques for that. There may be books, there are books written on meditation. I haven't read sure. any, but yeah. I have meditated. And right. it, it's a very beautiful thing, a way to learn. So uh, that is okay, so. what he taught me. Mm -hmm. Now, I thought of another of his visions was um, more on the science side of things. He too had a vision of a theater curtain, but it was about to rise. And I think this was some kind of prediction of the discovery of the atom and then the atom bomb, the, the fission of the atom. Right. right. Right? So this is the physicist interest in his life, which was big, apparently. He had one that he drew. He drew this. And he called it the atom. So that's one. And there were many. There were 20, 25, maybe 30 mm -hmm. such vision drawings in his uh, later years, and in those East Lansing years, he was drawing them. So we want to find them again, if we can. They may be at Sibley, some uh -huh. of them. I think some of them are. I don't know if all of them, but... Mm -hmm. um, you will have one, the one about where man's song ends, God's begins. There were three chords, and you see in the drawing, one strike another strike this way and another strike that way, each one in white against that black that Dad used to do on a drawing. And there were three chords that went with that musically. Oh my. Right? I'm really you curious. about that? I, I don't know about that. I want to see these chords. 
I want to hear <laughs> yes, them. I want to play like them. I want to hear them. Then yes. You can play them. Right. You musicians. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, you were also telling me about these piano improvisations that your father did. He improvised on the piano when you danced? Oh, yes. That was in East Lansing. That was my favorite childhood time. Um, Dad would come running down from the attic and bang some chords on the Mason and Hamlin. My sister says he stuttered on piano when he did that. <laughs> <laughs> but he was working on working out some composition. And then I would be there and home from school and and I'd say I want to dance and he would improvise for me. And he would make it beautiful and, you know, much nicer for me to dance all over the living room floor. Because at my summer camp, we always had a dance teacher. It was a theater camp. It's where I learned Shakespeare mm -hmm. and began to do Shakespeare there. So when he was improvising, what was the music like? Was it like, um, was it rhythmic or was it more like a Tchaikovsky, um, you know, ballet music? Um, kind of dreamy. Do you remember what the music was like? It was just beautiful, uh -huh. just beautiful to listen yeah. to in full when he used the whole keyboard mm -hmm. and rhythmic because mm -hmm. I could always time myself to what he was playing. It was just great fun, that's all I can tell you. Would he ever improvise without you dancing and just improvise and make up well, stuff? Well, I, I remember visiting him in New York when he lived uptown. 145th Street and and the Hudson River, Riverside Drive. Uh, he would sometimes go and turn on the radio and listen to the jazz players. And he would admire their musicianship. They were good musicians. But he never worked in that kind of music right. himself. He wasn't interested, but he did appreciate their musicianship. So he could do other things, but he just didn't do it. Right. And he never used anything, uh, what the modern composers are using, the 12 tone scale. Right. Um, no, he loved harmony too much, I think. Although he could, he could play around. I think he wrote some pieces experimenting with Using two different keys. Two different keys in one track. piece of music. Right. May, I don't know Those if it's one on the left hand and one in the right, or how he that's, did that. That's what it was. And there were these things yeah. called bitonal studies. Bitonal? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. he did that. He read a, a number of those. And I would love to hear those sometime, or at least see a score to those. If you have any of the music for those, I would love to take a look. Well, if, if there is... I don't have it, and yeah. it might be at uh, it's, Eastman. It's, I'm sure it's there. Um, tell me about um, other things about um, singing in your family when you were in, in East Lansing. Did your family sing together? Did you get, gather around the piano and sing songs? Well, or? at Christmas, we sure did. I Let me tell you what Christmas was, because it wasn't so much in the rest of the year. We did a little of that, but not a whole lot. But uh, Christmas was a very special time. The Christmas tree was something that was hidden from us. We were not to see it until, until Christmas morning when we went in to have our presents. But weeks before, he would give each of us money to go downtown and be able to buy presents for each other. And, of course, we all got some special present at Christmas. We got our bikes that way, you know, to ride, whatever. And uh, the tree itself, the decorations held little candle holders in which were German candles about that high, real candles. And he would have, when we finally went in to see the tree, the two older boys, Bryce and Art, would stand around with buckets of water and Dad would light the candles with matches. 
we had lit candles on our Christmas tree several years there. My. And I just thought that was magic. Nobody else did that. And of course, what we did was stand around and together and sing Silent Night. You could get through all three verses before he had to put out the candles. And then he had the help of Bryce and Art to, you know, be very careful blowing out each candle. And Dad did the tall ones. And uh, we never had a fire. My. This is just amazing, isn't it? I would love to tell you, though, about a trip that, if we're getting toward the end. The trip to Toledo. We'll, 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 we'll get to that in a, in a second. I want to ask you about um, your family love of poetry. Um, Emily Dickinson and uh, oh, yes. William Dad Blake. Oh, yes. Dad and Mother and... got all. You're right. Dad and Mother bought all the Emily Dickinson books as they came out. They even had the first one, which was, must have been 1904, that uh, her first book was done by, uh, what was his name? The um, man who, I forgot his name. I've forgotten his name, yeah. too, but I will get it one time. Emily wrote to him. They had a correspondence back and forth. Oh, my. And uh, finally, after she died, four years after she died, the first one was published. Then uh, Dad bought that and other books of poetry. And uh, Mother loved poetry. Mother wrote poetry. She wrote some very good poets, poems, a couple of them published in those things that they do for amateurs now. Right. Uh, so how did your father initially start corresponding with, with Emily Dickinson? How did that start? Do you know? He never corresponded you, you, with Emily you, Dickinson. You, she was dead. You said something about him writing her letters. You, he wrote songs based on Emily Dickinson's okay. poetry. Okay, I thought she was passed away, but I thought oh, you no, mentioned... Oh, no, no, no. Okay. He did never know, knew her yeah, personally. Right. Uh, you, you mentioned writing... It, or, when you said writing, writing songs, yeah, to what her. I meant, what I meant was that right. he was writing songs. Right, I, I was, yeah. I was thinking that um, she would have been had to have been passed and away. And they are published. They're the Boosie and Hawks, right? And Lady Dickinson songs, right? And I find them very lovely, and and uh, many people do. Paul Sperry, right, sang some and. Don Upshaw sang quite a few of them in a concert in New York that I went to. Right. And she's quite a singer. Her articulation is clear, Don Upshaw, and you can hear the words. And one of them she did was about asking God to preserve in his kingdom a home for the rat. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Dickinson poem. Oh, my. Did um, um, your family, did your parents read poems to you? Did you have poetry readings or were there books just on the shelf? Uh, did just books. Uh huh. The house was full of books. Yeah, but you didn't have poetry readings and things like that? Did, did you ever Mother, read? Mother in her intimate theater may have read poems mm -hmm. solo to her friends that came. But. Uh, I never read poems. I, I read. I remember learning to read when I was four years old in California. I got so excited I ran over to the teacher. And looked, there's a little schoolhouse right next to the house we lived in run by Mrs. Harris and showed her that I could read this poem and it was about a tree and I knew that and I, she was impressed. So I was impressed. I could read now. So yeah. I did readings of poems later in life. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are in the Belle of Amherst, and they are Emily's poems. But I've done a poetry reading now and then for friends, just, mm -hmm. just because I love them. Yeah, I'd love to hear you read some poems. Mother Tell me, wrote poems, though. Wow. And I have a number of her. She wrote Christmas poems sometimes in sonnet form and uh, sometimes not and just 
lovely things. And I think she would have liked to have been published too. But my son has inherited that talent. He's a poet too. And your son's name He's is? He's the family poet. Yeah. What's your son's name? David. David. Yeah, he's David Milbert. Tell me about your mother's singing voice. What was that like? Oh, it was beautiful. She could have been a singer. Uh, it was a beautiful. She used to sing. When we went to bed, she would come up to say the Lord's Prayer in Mother's bedroom. And, uh, and she would sing songs. She'd sing sailor songs that were her brother's. You know, he was an Annapolis man, Uncle Bill. And uh, they were great fun. And she sang beautifully. And she'd sing. What else did she sing? I don't know. All kinds of things. My heart is in commotion with the devil of the ocean. Where, <laughs> where there's something the, and the oceans roar. I don't know. But they were songs she had learned from her brother Bill. Mm -hmm. As well as the ones that everybody sings. We sang at the... Well, we sang around the house. B and I used to sing uh, out of a little golden songbook. I don't know what Dad had to do with that, but I thought they were just... Everybody had them. And you could open it and you could see the Star Spangled Banner or anything you wanted. All the famous American songs. Mm -hmm. And uh, we sang out of those books. And they didn't have any Farwell in them, uh -huh. but they, they were all familiar songs. What was your father's singing voice like? What was my father's singing voice like? Mother's was lovely, but Dad didn't sing very often. It was usually an imitation of himself, I think. <laughs> I don't know how to describe what his voice was like. It was, uh, what would it have been, baritone maybe, if he were singing something serious. I suppose if he worked for the opera in Boston, if they gave him a salary, he must have sung all right. Uh -huh. But I don't know his voice well. I know his speaking voice. Right. He was, well, we had to speak the King's English in our house. We weren't allowed to do all that crazy talk that kids do in school, we had to speak the king's English. And if we, if he said some word at the table that we didn't understand, we would say things like, whatever that means, and he would send us to the dictionary, and we had to look it up and share it and learn. So we all learned from Dad. Good language, good speaking. Of course, I learned to love to teach it, too. Fantastic. So you took a car trip with your father to Toledo, Ohio, to board a train um, oh, yes, to, to, to the summer to camp, camp He always in, in put Vermont. me on the train to camp. And one year it was in Toledo. And we had to make a stop. Oh, this was when Dad owned a car, which wasn't for very long. A few years he had it in the Michigan years. And uh, he called it Pegasus, out of its real name, Pegasus which was a horse, I believe. Right. And uh, he called it Pegasus because it used up so much gas. So he was driving me to Toledo. We made a stop in Jackson, Michigan to have lunch. And while we was having lunch, he drew something for me that connects with his visionary self. He drew a cross, like the Christian cross, and at the top, he drew on a, a napkin. He drew J at the top, V at the bottom, H on the right, and H on the left. And he said, that is Jehovah in the Hebrew. And I understand that when he wrote his book, he, he didn't use J, he used I. But for me, he knew I wouldn't understand what that was. So it isn't Jehovah, it's Jehovah. Mm -hmm. And uh, that at the top, the J stands for God, and the V at the bottom stands for mankind, man. And the right is the mind, or the left, 
and the right is the emotions. I don't know which was which. And that was an explanation of being to me early on. I was just a kid, mm -hmm. like 10 or something, 11 maybe. Um, but I remember it very well. And he talks about it in great detail in an article I'm giving to uh, Dr. Munstead. Uh, so you should read that. I you, will, will. you will enjoy reading that for us. And then we went to the public library in Jackson. We still had a little time. So he looked up Blake and brought out a book of Blake's poems. And he read to me the tiger, the famous tiger, tiger burning bright in the forests of the night. What immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful poet try? I don't think he ever wrote a song about it, but I think I could be wrong. There may be a song that he wrote about it, and that I think can be found out. But he also read The Lamb because he said he had a, a song in his head about that. And he did that on his lithography press back in East Lansing. I went on to camp and he sent the lamb to me printed on his lithography press and I showed it to the music teacher at camp and they said oh we'll have you sing that so I will sing one little bit of it I would love to hear that little lamb who made thee dost thou know who made thee gave thee life and bid thee feed by the stream and o'er the mead gave thee clothing of delight softest clothing woolly bright gave thee such a tender voice making all the hills rejoice little lamb who made thee Dost thou know who made thee? And when I was a kid, I guess my voice was, uh, it hadn't had been smoked away yet. And I'm now an old lady, so that's all I'm going to sing of that. But the second verse answers. Little lamb, I'll tell thee. Little lamb, I'll tell thee. We are called by his name, for he called himself a lamb. He was meek and he was mild. He became a little child. I a child and thou a lamb. We are called by his name. Little lamb, God bless thee. Little lamb, God bless thee. That's so beautiful. That's the whole thing. Mm. Thank and, you for uh, sharing Forgive me that. for singing at all. I, I mm. smoked for too mm. many years. And that now I'm paying for that. <laughs> but, I, but your singing there is still. Well, yeah, there really it is. enjoyed that. Thank you. And You're welcome. I think it's time to end this little interview, don't you think? Can we spend just a, a tiny bit, a um, little bit more on your your father's um, spirituality, and and, and and if you there's a little bit more you want to talk about his ideas about intuition. Um, and um, looks like his 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 mother, your um, your grandmother Sarah, was very influential on him about his spiritual ideas and getting him interested in Eastern well, uh, religious she, thought. She, I think, was interested in Eastern religion. Well, mother and father both were theosophists for a time. Mother remained one and never missed a meeting of the theosophists. And you know, theosophy means the study of God. So there are many ways to think of God. There are many religions. And uh, theosophy admits of any of them as ways to look at truth, ways to find truth, right? But Dad was beyond organized religion. He really was. He didn't need church. He was much too busy composing. But his spirit was very high, very evolved, I call that. It's what we call an old soul, 
Mm -hmm. I think both my parents were sort of old souls. And uh, I think I was very lucky to have them both as parents. Mother said, just be patient, just try, just try to do your best. And that's what I got mostly from her. You know, none of us are perfect. And uh, Dad was closer to perfect. I must say he did just about everything a human can do. <laughs> <laughs> Made all us children, then remarried and had more ch another child. It's, I mean, it's wonderful. And wrote music that we listen to when we can. Right. And I hope that will be more often once people are ready for that music. Some of it is published, some of it is not. Right, and we hope more yeah. of that. Uh, Schirmer's published some. Dad published a few of his own, and there's more to come, perhaps. Right, right. Only time will tell us that. So one last thing, and then we'll, we'll go. Your father's book called Intuition in the World Making from uh, 1948. Oh, is there from any 1948? I, in 1939, he completed it. Okay, he was but, telling me what was in it back okay. then. That, would, that was the date that I, would, that I got, so that, that date is, is questionable. I okay. think he finished it earlier. But okay. uh, it is a very complex. It would take a long time to talk all about what he thought about intuition. That is teaching from within. That's what it means. Tuition is learning, right? right? In is inside. And he had a method to do it, to get an intuition. And one of his chapters in the book, I think, is hunches to order. So we all get <laughs> hunches, right? I have a hunch, we say. So he took that into his, his discussion of how to get your answer. And the part of it was what I described to you about getting the mind totally quiet. You have a question. You need an answer to it. In life, it happens to us all, all the time. Not all the time, thank God. <laughs> but often. And we want an answer. And so his way was to quiet the mind, have the question clear, and in that quiet state of meditation to await the answer. And I guess the book tries to teach you how to do it. Right. He, his I never did it, practiced it well, but uh, I did meditate. And to me, that was the important part of it, really. And that's not easy. I did it for months and months in my 20s. And it just seems to me I'm living out the whole rest of my life, whatever I learned there in meditation. To me, it was meeting God. And I knew you had to die to meet anything <laughs> bigger than ourselves. Right. But perhaps we are, are in soul larger than our bodies. I don't know. I certainly felt so when I was getting actors to relax on the floor. And I'd say, think of yourself as 100 feet long, <laughs> <laughs> 50 feet across your shoulders, and you'd relax. You know, I taught relaxation to actors as well as voice. Wow. It was part of the voice teaching. Uh, so, so I really uh, cannot give you what's in that book. We're waiting for somebody to have the book that we will get published. We will right. see that it's published. I hope it's sometime. the next generation down that will do yeah. it. They're I all emailing each other. It's keeping Dad in the, in the world in some way. Absolutely. Which is nice. So is there any concluding um, thoughts or observations that, that you want to share um, in, at the end of the interview here? Just the overall wonderful act activity of dad, of Arthur Farwell. He was never relaxed except after supper at night. <laughs> then he would play games with us, even Monopoly. 
who played with us now and then, taught us anagrams. But that was an after supper thing. When, when I was a child, I'd climb on his lap and we'd play slapping games, you know, catch your hand and yeah. hold it and try to get away, that kind of a game. And then, or he would play chess with Bryce, who was the oldest boy, a teenager by then, good enough to learn chess. And Bryce eventually became a chess teacher. He oh did my. that in his retirement. My. Um, you told me you, you, on the, the phone the other day, you were talking about your father's um, integrity and, and character, and you said you wanted to talk about that. Did you want to, his, his character and integrity, you, you oh, had some things to say about that. His, his reliability, you could always count on him. If he said he was going to do something, he did it. His King's English I've already spoken of. <laughs> and Mother's family, when he, they were courting, I guess Mother brought him home. And before, before she could bring him home, they said to her, does he speak the king's English? So <laughs> that was something that was known in our family, was the king's English. Uh -huh. We weren't allowed slang. Yeah. Or swearing. He never swore. He said, caramba, or he said, thunderation, <laughs> if he hit his head on the cupboard or something, you know. Uh -huh. He'd holler that way. <laughs> he would not swear. Yeah. I was 15 before I heard my first swear word. I didn't know what that was, you know, it just seemed awful. But in our childhood, there was no yeah. swearing. Yeah. None of us right. it wasn't allowed. And chewing gum wasn't allowed. Uh, there were a number of things we were disciplined about. <laughs> Have to sit on a chair for half an hour, but we weren't ever spanked physically. I think the only time I ever saw Dad angry was when Jonathan, who was the little one, about two or three years old, who was curious about this world, left the dinner table, went into the back room where all the, the best dishes were sitting on a pool table. The pool table had been a gift one Christmas. And a pool table has little metal ways to hold the legs in place. And apparently he fidgeted with it enough so that it, the whole table crashed and all the dishes with it. Dad stood up. We all heard this. We were all at the table. He stood up and his face was white. That was the only time I ever, he, he took him up to the attic. I prayed he got a spanking. Well, one of the stories of what happened yeah, in East Lansing. Yeah. So we, that's how the wedding dishes were gone. <laughs> <laughs> and some other dishes. Yeah. So I think this is a good, good place to, to stop. And I, I want to thank you so much for, for sharing today. This was just so beautiful of you. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. So thank you. Okay. <laughs>